All right, so we've talked about our theme, we've given some introduction, but let's dive into the exciting stuff, right? Let's talk about what's new with ArcGIS. Now in this next section, we're going to be highlighting new capabilities within our existing products starting with ArcGIS Pro. It's our go-to desktop application for both 2D and 3D visualization and spatial analytics. We're constantly making improvements to ArcGIS Pro, including things like parcel management tools, which we heard from many of you are really important. Coming soon, expect more for GPS support and other uh, items such as interactive suitability modeling. And it's really important that we maintain this product. So many people are using it. In fact, how many of you are currently using Pro? Show of hands. Excellent, that's great to see. Well now, I'm not gonna highlight every single item that we've updated in Pro, and that's because we have a really helpful roadmap document that is updated by the Pro product team and available to you through the GeoNet community. So make sure, write it down in those fancy new notebooks, the, go to the GeoNet community and download that roadmap so you can see everything that has been updated. In addition to the core capabilities of ArcGIS Pro, we're also making enhancements to the extensions. Many of the common extensions are still there, such as Spatial Analyst, but I'm excited to highlight one new extension that's in transformational. It's called Locate XT. And what this is about, it's focusing on utilizing the technology to leverage unstructured text. So imagine the power of taking unstructured text and um, pulling out place names and geo coordinates and applying it directly to a map. That's technology that we haven't had before, so this is transformational. As I mentioned before, we're continually updating ArcGIS Pro. It is our desktop, uh, our ongoing desktop application. It's the next generation of desktop tools really incorporating 3D across all workflows. But enough about updates on um, some of the new items, Nicole's gonna show you what some of these look like. So you've already seen my startup screen for Pro, and you're familiar with this screen, right? It starts with choosing a recently used project, or you can start from scratch using a map or scene-focused template. But I wanna call your attention to something else, and that is project templates. These are items that can be shared across your portal or even a network drive. And they're really useful for several reasons. When I open this new project template, it's automatically going to create the data connections to either service servers or databases that should be used for this particular workflow. And you'll see those here in our catalog window. Also, any layouts that would be recommended for this type of work and this type of project are imported and really importantly, style files are already part of the project so that you don't have to go looking around for the ones you need. Now you'll notice here that I have multiple instances of Pro open, and I'm gonna focus now on the water distribution network in Naperville, Illinois. Let's zoom in a bit, and I'll show you the hydrant data represented by these red dots and the blue service lines that connect them. There are several ways that are new or recently added to Pro that can help you maintain data quality. We probably aren't thinking about the data quality of hydrants unless you're working in public safety and you know how vital having accurate asset and location information is. However, I think about hydrants sometime when I'm looking for a good parking spot. Now, this asset ID, I can find a particular one by creating an attribute query, or I can use the new tool, Find and Replace. So much like in a Excel spreadsheet, I could search for FH122, and the attribute table zooms right to it. I could search by all or part of the field, and this is much easier than creating a very specific query. Now let's say that my organization wants to change the naming convention across all of the data. I can use the replace one at a time, or I can replace them all. And now my data is going to be updated automatically without having a new field added, doing a whole arcade-based text expression to calculate the new asset ID. It's done all at once for me, which is really handy. You'll notice in my map that the labels have also been updated to reflect my new naming convention in the asset IDs. And here I have several different types of 
of barrels and different fire hydrants that I can add to my map. But I'd like to show you instead a group template. So this enables me to draw both the service line and the point hydrant at the end. When I finish it, they're both added to the map automatically. So let's take a look at the attribute rule and see some special things that Pro has done for us. The first I'll call your attention to is contingent values. So for example, if I know that these two pieces were um, manufactured by the company Cori, there might only be two nozzle diameters. However, if I change it to, let's say, American Darling, we're seeing there's a much larger uh, number of hydrant nozzle diameters to choose from. And contingent values are great because they help you maintain the quality of your data by not accidentally entering in a value that wouldn't pertain to a related value. Another thing you might have noticed in the map is that the hydrant asset ID was automatically populated down both in the label and down here in the attributes itself. So this is really nice, and it was done using attribute rules. Attribute rules have been around since Pro, but they get more and more powerful with every release. So in this case, the, uh, the, an arcade expression took a look at the new assets that were added, and it found the next incremental number that should be appended to HYD dash. Also, call your attention to service territory north. This was also created by a calculation rule, one of the many attribute rules that we have. So in this case, it looked at the spatial location of the new hydrant, and it found that it's within the north service territory. In addition to these calculation type of rules, we also have validation rules and constraint rules. And these really help you get Pro to do more work for you. So let's take a quick pause there because she just showed you a lot of new things in Pro for editing tools. So let's review. So it was project templates, find and replace. What a time saver that is. Group templates, very helpful. And lastly, contingent values and the all important attribute rules. So those were all for editing. What do we have new for visualization? We have quite a lot. I'm looking here at the Police service areas in Washington, D.C., you see that very distinct um, diamond shape that represents the district. And I have crime data for this area, about 35,000 points, and it's a bit hard to make sense of any patterns over space and time. Starting at Pro 2.4, you can use the geoprocessing tool, Enable Feature Binning, to simplify the rendering of this data. Let me show you what I mean. When I select the layer and turn feature binning on, the map automatically updates to represent how many points are within each of these polygons. So the darker hexagons represent more crime points, and the lighter hexagons represent fewer. As I zoom in, the polygons update automatically. And anywhere there's blank space, no crimes occurred at all. Feature binning also respects um, definition queries. So for example, if I only wanted to look at theft from auto, the map would redraw at that scale. Now let's look at all of our crime types and talk about time visualizations, because we know that it's really important to understand how our data varies over space, but we're really focusing on giving our users more tools to represent space and time together. One such tool is the chart the calendar heat chart. So when I specify the date variable, the chart will draw, and this is going to show, I'd like it to show by year, or actually day of the week and hour of the day. And these also respect de definition queries. So going back to my theft from auto, I now see this distinct pattern on weekdays, where between 8 and 10 a.m., there's kind of a lot of these dark boxes. So a lot of theft from auto incidences have been reported. And my speculation would be this is when people are going out to their car to go to work in the morning, and then they realize something has been stolen. Bad morning. Not the best day. Morning. Now, the next thing I'd like to do is talk about applying symbology from a style. Let's say that I have a set of symbols 
for my crime incidences, and I would really like to apply them based on the unique value of a fence type. So I get this, um, I still have my definition query on, so let me turn that off. I get this kind of Easter egg, gray, cornucopia, like cornucopia of um, colors here. Let me go back to the offense type. There we go. And this is really not telling me much about what type of crime is going on, especially if I zoom in. I can't tell how these features are different from one another. So I want to show you how you can now match layer symbology to a style. I have a style that I've used before. Maybe a colleague has shared it with me or I've created it another time. And now, rather than setting those symbols one by one, they can be applied all together, which is a great time saver. So let's say I'd like to do some analysis here. I want to understand how many crime occurrences are happening in each police service area. I might do this with a series of geoprocessing tools. And in fact, I've already done this before. You can see it in my history pane. This really reminds me of being in grad school when I'm trying to develop a new methodology and I'm trying a tool, seeing what its output is, jotting it down in my notebook, trying the next step, jotting it down, crossing it off. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just use the history pane to see all of the tools you've run and their parameters and whether or not they succeeded. Now, since this is something that I would like to analyze multiple times, it's a process that's rather repeatable, I can select all of my history and export it to a model. And it's right there in Pro for me. This would also be a great candidate to export right to the Python window or to a Python script to start iterating on this process and improving it with my own custom code. So speaking of custom code, if that's in your wheelhouse and you have a set of developers, I would like to re recommend Jupyter Notebooks, which are now available in Pro 2.5. So you can import a project notebook and share it as an item across your users in your portal. And Jupyter Notebooks are really powerful for perhaps onboarding a new developer because it shows them very, in a very plain English way, different steps. The, the coding is very clear, it's plain English. If you put in these nice comments, you can see the graphical output of each step. And you can even test out one step at a time and run it if you like. Now, going back to my original intention, I want to look at the number of crime incidences across this whole area. So one way I might do this is to symbolize it in 3D in my scene. And now I can see that the higher service areas and the darker areas represent a higher crime count for this particular week. And moving on throughout time, I can see how that changes week to week. Now that's pretty cool, but let's say I want to share this visualization with others. We have new capabilities in the Pro Animation Framework, which enable you to exaggerate and offset vertical content to really tell a more holistic story and get your point across to those who are looking at your visualization. Well, and that's all well and good, but I'm really excited because I heard that pie charts and graphs are back in Pro. So can we highlight what that looks like? For sure, let's do it. So. We have heard from our users that there was something they were really missing in Pro, and that was the symbology to uh, create charts. Let me show you what I mean. Down here, you can now, again, use bar charts, pie charts, and I'll use this example pie chart and add a few different crime types. So how about burglary? Uh, we'll do theft from auto again, and maybe keep with the theme um, arson. Okay. That looks good. So we have some options for our charts. We can use them as a fixed size, or we could vary that by the total number of crimes in that district. I can remove the leader lines if I like. And I can even display them in 3D. Wow, that looks excellent. So once again, I'm going to pause because you went through a lot of new capabilities for visualization. Let's say you talked about feature binning, which we've had starting in 2.4, but it's um, enhanced in 2.5.
Matching layers to a style, calendar heat chart, an excellent option for showing those all-important temporal patterns, adding in Jupyter notebooks to give you more flexibility with your scripting, chart symbology, and then something else that I'm really excited about, new options including that slideshow option, right? A better compelling way to share your information and maps with others. So let's talk about maps, right? That's not why we're all in GIS. Let's talk about maps and new items for cartography. I'd like to add this map that I made to a new layout. So if I first wanted to share the project with someone else in my organization, of course I could export the whole project package and they could take it and get up and running. But I do want to make a cartographic product in this example. So I'll show you first a few ways that I can create a new layout. Now in Pro 2.5, you can look at, you can import a layout that's been used elsewhere in your organization and see how it's going to look when you bring in your own data. So the one that I like is this one. And now when I just point the map frame right over to my DC map, all of the data is populated quickly, including my title and legend, and it's a rather fast way if you're pumping out maps quickly and sharing them with others. So if I'd like to share this, the print options are now built into Pro, and it's not a pop-up modal screen anymore, but it is running in the background, so you can continue working. We have a lot of options here, including password-protecting PDFs, and even if you're printing a large poster, you can set up the tiling right here in this print dialog window. Now, if I'd like to export it, something that's really exciting in Pro 2.5 is the Adobe Illustrator file type. So, if you're like me, perhaps a, when I was a county government worker and I was sharing maps with my tourism department who needed to take my so-so cartography and make it spectacular, they were using the Adobe Maps for Creative Cloud Suite and wishing that I could give them a vector type file. So that's what the AIX file type is. And now it's available for you to share your work with those that are working perhaps in a more graphic design focused space. Now there's one more thing that we can talk about that's really going to improve cartography, and that's the ability to reshape graphic elements. So we're used to our pictures and our text boxes being little rectangles, right? Now I can add and edit vertices, because I'd really prefer that this text wasn't overlapping my countries. If I could make it go along the waterline, that would look a lot more professional. It is great. I know. Can, can we applause on that one? That's, thank you. Okay, don't tell our develop, developer team, but out of all the updates they've made in Pro 2.5, this is my favorite. Why? Because we are no longer bound by square and rectangular text boxes. You too can have eloquent and elegant maps due to edit editing the vertices on your maps. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm.